Friends in Christ, I wanted to be uh, clear on a few things that I think are very, very important to us, and they're kind of on the forefront um, in our society today, in our world today. And that is the, the very, very clear teaching that the church has and has always had when it comes to the sanctity and the gift of human life, especially when we're speaking about abortion. The U.S. bishops recently had a statement, and that would say it's the preeminent issue. It's our main concern. And really, all other life issues flow from there because we look at life from its, its moment of conception. Another thing and related to that is the whole notion of the contraceptive mentality. Pope St. John Paul II said if we want to eradicate abortion, we have to eradicate the contraceptive mentality, in other words, against conception. And we want to make sure that we do that by not giving over to things such as birth control, these, these different things, anything that would, that would uh, hinder uh, the creation, procreation of life. Remembering that God is always the giver and the author of human life. And what we're called to do is we're called to cooperate with him. So God's the giver and the author. We're called to cooperate with him. I share these words with you today as before I break open the word because in recent years, even in recent months, and especially in recent weeks, there have been another number of prominent Catholic politicians. I'm not speaking Democrat, Republican. I'm not speaking of any of those things. I'm just simply speaking as prominent Catholic uh, politicians. And one is Catholic by virtue of his baptism. When we are baptized, the stain of original sin is removed. We're made new creations in God. We're able to call God our Father, right? And we're also incorporated into the body of Christ. That's what makes us Catholic. But the next question comes, what makes us a good Catholic? And I would argue, and I believe the church would argue, a good Catholic is someone who gives over to the tenets and the teachings of our Catholic faith. So, to hold an opposite opinion of something uh, such as life, and not only hold an opposite opinion on that, but to advance that opposite opinion and try to and attempt to enshrine it in law or protect it in a law such as Roe v. Wade, which is a bad law, to, re to protect it in that, would be something that would be grave and known as a mortal sin. And so for somebody who would remain in that and perpetual and remain obstinate to that and to the church's teaching, that person would remain in a state of sin. And the church teaches us, plain and simple, when we find that ourselves, if we are in a state of mortal sin, what are we to do? We're to refrain from receiving Holy Communion. Because communion is also an outward sign that we are in communion with the church. But if we hold that opinion, if we try to advance that teaching, right, and we try to enshrine it in law, then we're not in communion with the church because we're not in communion with the teachings of the church. But as we've heard recently, some people, prominent, some prominent Catholic politicians have said that you can be a, a Catholic, which is true by virtue of our baptism, but you can be a good Catholic by holding that opposite opinion. You can't, that's a lie. And we know who's behind the ultimate lie, the evil one is behind the ultimate lie. And the evil one's always trying to undo anything that God has, has uh, done and God has established. And because God is the author and the given of, giver of human life, uh, the evil one is always trying to get at that. If we go back to the very beginning, we go back to uh, Genesis. We see that God creates man in his own image. He creates them male and female. He calls them to come together and he invites them and, and it calls them to be fruitful and to multiply. So let's look at those things that God has done from the very beginning. And let's also take a look and say, are these things under attack in our society? And do we have people that are are, are trying to move this forward, even people who would consider themselves good practicing Catholics. In the beginning, God creates them, male and female. He creates them in his image and likeness. So, as we can see, there are two sexes. And as Peter Kreeft would say, uh, your sex is something you do, is something you are before you do it. Your sex is something you are before you do it. There's male and female, that's a truth 
that comes to us from our faith, and it's a truth that we're also able to see in the natural law. But we've seen in our society today that that's trying to be undone. That people are trying to say, well, you can be whoever you claim to be, not who you were born as, biologically born as, male or female. You can make that decision for yourself. And I would argue that the person who is behind that lie is the evil one. Go all the way back to the beginning. He's always trying to undo whatever God has established because what God has established is good. So that we're created in the image and likeness of God, man and male and female, that is something that is good. To hold an opinion and try to advance an opinion, anything opposite of that, I would argue, is sinful. So God creates them male and female, creates them in his image and likeness. He calls them not to be apart, but he calls them to come together. A beautiful expression of the unitive aspect that we find in the sacrament of holy matrimony. So God creates a male and female, calls them to come together as one, as one flesh. And we are also able to see that with Pope St. John Paul II used to speak about that complementarity, how men and women who are equal, created in the image and likeness of God, come together as one, and what they do is they complement each other in a beautiful way. And that makes perfect sense because this is how God has created us, and he calls us to come together. You're also able to see in our society how people are trying to unravel that, or trying to undo that, to say it's okay for two men to be married or two women to be married, and even we're looking at one woman and a number of men, or one man and a number of women, and on and on and on and on it goes. And uh, the further that we get away from God's plan, the more absurd that it becomes. And again, who's behind this? Ultimately, who is behind this is the evil one. Because the evil one is influencing people to put forth this sort of thought, which isn't true. Again, it's something that we find in our faith. It's something that we find in the natural law. And then finally, what else does God do? He calls us to be fruitful and to multiply. In other words, be open to the gift of life. And we see in our society when we advance things such as abortion, when we advance things such as embryonic stem cell research, when we advance things such as the use of contraception, or advance things such as euthanasia, these are things that are not only on the federal level, but these are things that are also on the state and local level. So when we advance these sort of things, what we're doing is we're going contrary to what God has established, truths of our faith and the things that we come to know in the natural law. And I'd ask the question, well, who's behind that? And I can, you could probably answer that and say, ultimately, the evil one is behind it. Because if we go back to the very beginning, the evil one is always trying to unwind and undo whatever God has established because God has established something that is good. It is good that he creates us in his image and likeness. It is good that we are created male and female. It is good that man might not be alone, but come together and come together in the unitive aspect, right? The man and the woman coming together. And it is good that God calls us to be fruitful and to multiply and to cooperate with, with him because he is the giver and the author of all human life. This is very, very clear teaching, very clear teaching of the church. So what I would encourage you to do is don't be hoodwinked or don't be um, uh, 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 taken in by some of this slick teaching that will say, well, the church hasn't always taught these things or they'll kind of try to nuance these things. Well, the church hasn't really been clear on the issue of ensoulment and all these different things. Don't be taken in by that because again, who is ultimately behind this? The one who is ultimately behind this is the evil one. He is the great deceiver. He's going to say what is good, right, is actually bad, and what is bad is actually good. And unfortunately, many people are giving in to this, this, this lie, this lie uh, that he tries to perpetuate. So, as I said, you can't be a good Catholic and say that I believe in abortion Say, but I, I believe in something like contraception and the use of it. Say that I believe in something like embryonic stem cell research, which destroys human life. Or to say that I believe in something um, like uh, uh, non, 
uh, it, to believe in same-sex marriage, so-called marriage. You can't, you can't be a good Catholic and hold those opinions or even advance those opinions. We can be a Catholic by virtue of our baptism, but part of our baptismal call is to live out our faith. And if we're not living out our faith, it's no more than belonging to, the, to, to a local club or a local group. It's no more than that. And those things don't lead us to eternal life, but our faith, what does our faith offer us? Our faith offers us the gift of eternal life. And so if someone is, defines themselves in this um, holding these opinions and maybe in advancing these opinions in law, what ought they do? And I would say what they need to do is the very first thing that Jesus speaks about when he comes onto the scene. Jesus says, repent and believe in the good news. Or in other words, turn away from the sin. Turn away from that which you hold to be wrong and turn back to the truth, turn back to the gospel. So have that complete conversion. And if one finds himself in mortal sin, what does he do? He takes advantage of the gift that Jesus has given us. That's the sacrament of reconciliation. Praise God, we have sacrament of reconciliation here every day with the exception of Sunday. And so there's all sorts of opportunities in order to do that. However, if one remains obstinate and one remains in that, that mindset, right, and one remains in their sin, there's all sorts of other grave sins, what must one, what must one do? One must refrain from receiving Holy Communion. And why is that? And I would say because of what St. Paul says. If we approach Holy Communion unworthily, what do we do? We bring down con condemnation upon ourselves. In other words, we bring down damnation amongst ourselves. And so if we find ourselves in a state of original sin, or if we find ourselves in, in a state of sin, mortal sin, it's best for us to refrain until we can repent, until we can have a, a conversion of heart, and until we can get to the sacrament of, whole, of, 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 of reconciliation. In order that we can receive the life of grace, we can be brought back into that right relationship with God, rather than on re receiving our Lord unworthily. Or if we receive him unworthily, again, we bring condemnation down upon ourselves. We shouldn't want that for ourselves, we wouldn't, shouldn't want that for anyone else. And we shouldn't, and because God does not want that for us as well. Very, very clear teaching what the Lord gives us in terms of uh, this basic teaching of our church. And I'll give you a couple little things uh, I'll leave you with uh, today. Um, concerning abortion, this is what the church teaches. But don't listen to what somebody says. Well, the church teaches this, and if it's contrary, we know that's a lie. The church teaches this. Abortion is a deliberate termination of pregnancy by killing the unborn child. Such direct abortion, willed either as an end or as a means, is gravely contrary to the moral law. The church attaches the canonical penalty of excommunication to this crime against human life. Excommunication. Excommunication can be a good thing. It has a medicinal purpose. I think sometimes excommunication within the church is portrayed in the world is that if we want to excommunicate somebody and be done with them, right? We have no relationship with them ever again, but that's not the case. Excommunication is medicinal. It's like good medicine for us. Sometimes that medicine can taste bad, but it's medicine that can help us. And excommunication, the meaning is, is almost sometimes to put paddles to somebody and shock them out of their you know, kind of wake them up to see whatever they're, they're doing is wrong. Put smelling salts under someone's nose and to wake them up and see what you're doing is wrong. And hopefully invite that person to repentance and to return to the sacrament of reconciliation, return to the, the, the sacrament of the churches, and to return to the life of grace, to be a good and active member of the body of Christ. So excommunication is something that can be good for someone. Sometimes it's portrayed in the, in the public in a very, very, in a very, very wrong way. And then finally, I'll just share you these words with, this is what the church teaches about communion. Holy communion, the reception of the body and blood of Christ in the Eucharist. More generally, our fellowship and union with Jesus and other baptized Christians in the church, which has its source and summit 
in the celebration of the Eucharist. In this sense, church as communion is the deepest vocation of the church. So for somebody to hold that opposite opinion of what the church teaches and believes in, uh, in, the, in the area of human life, especially out of its moment of conception, uh, would be something that is wrong and that person would remain in their sin. Again, Catholic by baptism, but not a good Catholic because they're not practicing their faith in the proper way. So what must they do? Again, they must repent. They must believe in the good news. They must avail themselves to the sacrament of reconciliation and then return to the sacraments. If they don't, what they're doing is a false outward sign. To receive communion, not only receiving it unworthily and bringing condemnation down upon themselves, but it's a false outward sign. What they're saying to the body and they're saying to the world is, I'm in communion with the church, when in fact they're not in communion with the church because they hold an opinion that is completely opposite, opinion that, uh, that is, uh, promotes uh, mortal sin, and unfortunately with many politicians who claim to be uh, good and practicing Catholics is that they, um, they try to advance these things. So what do we do, right? Do we get mad, do we get angry with them? Well, sometimes you know, anger can be righteous, these things are true. But what we should do is we simply should pray. We should pray. God desires that all people come to salvation. God desires that all people come to know the truth. You and I, we know we fall short in the life of grace many times in our lives. And so what we should do is pray for one another that we don't do that. And so if God desires that all people come to know salvation, then we should have that very same desire for everyone and pray for everyone. Pray for everyone that, that they can hold fast to the truth, that they can live out their baptismal promises, that they can be in union with Christ, and then they can approach the altar of our Lord in a worthy manner so that they can receive the graces of the sacraments and then go on with their life and, and live their life having been empowered with the grace of God. So prayer, prayer, and prayer. Pray for ourselves, pray for our brothers and sisters that we can always cooperate with God's plan as he has revealed to us sacred tradition, sacred scripture, and in the natural law.